If you fail to understand, then the same incredible terror that's menacing me will strike at you! Hey guys, thanks for dropping by. Uh, you know, uh, once again, we had a really smooth Mitch Brisker start. But anyway, it's great to see you all. Um, so I'm here with Jeff Levin, who is joining us from Baja, California, where he is uh, straight off of the festival circuit. Let me bring him on. Hey, Jeff. Hey. hey. So, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm stuck in Cancun. Oh, That's too bad. Oh, Can Cancun. I thought you were in Baja. That's right. You're in Cancun. Yeah, no, we went straight from New York. Uh, from the Dances with Film Festival, which turned out really nice. Um, nice turnout and really supportive film festival. Very highly respected. Nice, then, nice. We flew from there to Cancun, and I've been doing the spiritual retreat, and now we're about almost ready to go home because nice. I've got another film festival in San Francisco. Great. So, which wow. we're going to talk about. And that's on that's Monday. Good. So I fly home on Sunday and then I fly back out to San Francisco on Monday. So you know what that means? Any of you who are listening from San Francisco, I don't know if there is anybody, uh, please please come out and support Jeff. And if you're in LA, this is a great, great reason to go to San Francisco. Yeah, right. It, well, yeah, I mean, so. <laughs> it's a bit of a drive or a flight. You know, it's only a 45 minute, it's a 45 minute flight. It's like no big deal. Exactly. Hey, before we go on, I just want to put up this comment from yeah, Marilyn please. Honig. Uh, Marilyn Honig of Coffee, Colts, and Crafts, she said, I saw Brothers Broken when it was available for preview. I watched it three times. Amazing story and so well done. I cried each time. Jeff, you're a legend. I uh, just oh. wanted to embarrass you with that, Jeff. But thanks, Marilyn. I, I, Thank you, Jeff, Marilyn. Jeff is a legend, is... and I can't watch it without crying. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, it's weird when you make you know, I, I, there was so much angst in cutting that film in terms of just trying to get it to flow, right? Right. But fortunately, I have an incredible editor, uh, Tim Jansen, and he's got an eye, ear, and cutting that's, he's brilliant. Anyway, um, I've watched, when I watch the film with an audience, it's tough. I'll bet. Because, because there's some emotional spots in it. And I've been through it as an as a, a editor and producer and director on it. When you're with an audience, though, that emotion is kind of like a wave. You have no control over it. And, and so far, yeah. the audience response has been really supportive and positive. It's fantastic. That's great. Hey, I just want to say... Uh, Tina in the last 20, good evening, Mitch, and good evening, Tina, thanks for being here. And Abota29 says, uh, and hello, Mitch and friends. So anyway, let's, let's uh, San Francisco, that's interesting. You know, Scientology hasn't had any kind of a presence in San Francisco in a long time. It, it, the Bay Area used to be a bastion of Scientology. Oh. It, was so, it, it really took off in the um, mid 60s really started taking off and when we were exposed to it in san jose in 1968 there was a mission in santa santa clara there was a mission holder chick chick Clacos, i can still remember really nice guy and we were introduced to that through a mission which they were very one-on-one, -on -one, very personable, not militaristic at all. It was just more like, hey, hang out. Nice people. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll give you a, a little anecdote about that is we were interfacing and in getting our training, our courses, and then our therapy auditing at the mission, which was in Santa Clara. And then... I'm not sure why, but we got sent up to San Francisco for the big organization. Right. And we were, to, we were actually spoiled by this nice, personable, friendly little mission. We go up to the Oregon, people are all wearing blue shirts or white shirts and ties, and we were rock and rollers. 
and it was like right get us out of here it was such right. a different vibe it's so, amazing at the time yeah hey but, jeff then, yeah just one Go quick ahead. thing i i just noticed the uh, power cord fell out of my laptop so <laughs> okay just i'm gonna i'm gonna just take 30 seconds just carry on oh you won't okay um the other thing about um the organizations of big churches in the big cities was they were all dilapidated at the time they really were just not getting the kind of money that they needed to be upgraded so that was another thing that was um, something that turned us off and that carried through to when we went to Los Angeles to the bigger organizations. None of them were what you have now, Gold Leaf and Fancy. And at the time, this was right. 1968, 69. Everything was kind of low key. And, and right. At the time, they wanted to keep it that way because Hubbard was kind of under the radar at that time in terms of he didn't want things to get too big. That's what right. it, it, and that was around that time period. And uh, well, really, that's not, amazing because you know he, he was always just about expansion and getting new people, but they they were really not trying to I guess draw attention to themselves. Well, there was still a lot of of legal issues in the mm -hmm. countries that were attacking um the organization and him and so yeah he was he was trying to walk the type tightrope expand get everything expanding at the same time not show that they're you know not spending too much money they didn't really have the money to do right. the fancy kind of stuff that they do now um and so that that didn't really change until what the nineties or the right? The, it just right. I think. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm trying to think when the uh, that uh, the 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 ideal organ San Francisco opened because I remember I went up there. Let me see. My son, he 15 years ago. My son just turned 30. He was like 15. Wow. I think he was 15. We went on a little road trip. I took him up there. While we were up there, I wanted to take him to Chinatown. Just you know, go have a, a you know, oh, yeah, you got to experience yeah. that. Uh, you know, originally I was from the originally from the Bay Area as well. And um, I remember those dinners with my family in Chinatown. So that I wanted to take my, good. yeah, I wanted to take my kid, and then I realized that the ideal org was just on the outskirts. So I took him on a tour, and it was, you know, that was back in yeah. the days when th things were busy. When was, I guess that would have been uh, in the 2000s sometimes, so early 2000s. Oh, you're right, 2004, 2005. Yeah, yeah, it would have been, yeah, in there, maybe a little yeah, bit things, later. Yeah, things, things were still, still popping still yeah i barely remember the org you know because of my position i i couldn't just walk in i had to call up to gold and then have gold call somebody in management and then they would call somebody at the org and say hey just let this guy in to look around uh and i i have very vague memories of that but i really remember the dim sum in chinatown I oh mean, yeah <laughs> that's, that's I what i read I used to from that chinatown. day yeah. yeah, Chinatown is the best. When I was a little kid, I don't know if this is true anymore, but when I was a little kid living in San Francisco before we moved to LA, uh, the, the, the phone exchange, the operators would answer in Chinese. Like if you called, oh. if you were in Chinatown and you called information, like you called 411 or you dialed over an operator, they would answer in Chinese. And then if you spoke English, then they would speak English. Wow. So okay. it was really like, I mean, it was just, you know, it was like a gremlins, you know, you'd expect to go walk down the end of an alley and find some old herbalists who had like strange little alien creatures for sale. Well, they were, they almost was. Yeah, point. it was pretty cool. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, hey, listen, for people that, I have a clip here from the film for people that aren't uh, familiar with that, I thought okay, we might thanks. show that. Yeah. Hold on one second. I don't know why this isn't playing. Let me just start this over, okay? I think it's just like, I think it's like loading or something. We're having technical difficulties, folks. Well, that, that is, that's Gene Mason. 
um, on the Dick Clark show, Gene is one of our lead singers. Don't go away. I took myself out on my own stream. How about that? Hey, oh, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that one more time, and then I think maybe okay. we'll yeah, we'll just great. yeah, we'll we'll find some other way to uh, you know be boomers, I guess. Okay, here we go. Load this thing up. Anyway, thank you all for stopping by. Oh, here we go. Oops, that's the wrong one. That's okay, cool so one. yeah, that's uh, a cool I, I can one. Give my, I can give my new film a plug. Yeah, okay, this is a preview of Jeff's next film. Sunrise on a mountainside, copper shines under disappearing stars. In a sea of sleepy sapphire, but it's waking up just like what I found inside. Got a mind to wonder if the fear is part of me. I'm leaving back while I'm waking up. Daylight breaking through the Maybe the stream is it, it, the music's playing, but the audio, the picture's not playing. Oh, I don't know what uh, I don't know what's going on. But I'm the music. It. I, I saw oh, are you okay? Fine. Let me just put up. Uh, I'm taking back my life I see daylight I see daylight Daylight Nice, nice. So tell us about that. Well, I got the idea when I left the cult, we're talking about Scientology. Right. Um, all <laughs> I of hope a sudden, there was a huge void. I, can, I no longer had this massive purpose to be able to save the planet. Right. And, I was, and then I was going to go off and like change the universe as well. Right. Well, that, I actually believed that. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh. Hold on. 23 so, states, where did hold your on, travels hold on, take hold on. you? Uh, they took us. Okay, that worked. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why that worked. It all of a sudden just popped on. Uh, so I, go ahead and finish, Jeff, and then we'll, we'll anyway, talk about it. Anyway, so and, and I, I'd like to, this is a pretty interesting idea for people who leave any, any of these high control religious groups or cults or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're and usually were taken up by this really high purpose it just seems like wow we're going to be helping mankind right. in some way shape or form and once you realize that they're full of excrement i can use that word you can um what do you do it's kind of like this huge letdown where do i go now you know like helping stray cats or stuff like right. that, you know. Right. I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with that, but I mean, it's not quite as high a purpose. Yeah, because you don't you don't lose the impulse to you don't lose your idealism. I mean, maybe you become cynical and it becomes crushed down, but originally you kind of joined because of your your idealism, and then you yeah, well, you absolutely. And the young idealism, I joined when I right. was 23. Um, anyway, I had to look around and and deal with that when I was deprogramming. And almost immediately, I realized, okay, I'm part of this group that has actually really a great track record for inspiring people right. and, and helping people kind of live, get through life in a positive way. And I, and I would realize, okay, I write music for films. I write songs. Um, I had... Um, a storytelling performance art group mm -hmm. called Celestial Navigation. We used to inspire people all the time with the music right, and stories. Right. And, and then I had my band People, which and we just decided to come back after 50 years and cut a new album. And then I realized, okay, 
I have a lot of experience now. I have the wisdom and I'm erasing the pain that was involved with it by deprogramming. Right. So now I can just use the wisdom without really having to deal with the ego. It's just I want to help people. Right. So I decided my message is, um, and what I want to do is help other music artists, uh, up and coming or older, whatever, it doesn't make any difference, because you're never too old with music. You are never too old. And there's a few unknown guys that are still proving that, like, what's his name, mm -hmm. Nick Dagger? I think. Oh, yeah. He's like 106 now, isn't he? Something yeah. like that. That guy's indefatigable yeah. or whatever. Yeah, he's, that's he's yeah, that like works. Amazing. Indefatigable, yeah. I yeah, mean, and he's not the only one. There's other bands touring. They're like my age or older than me. Yeah, and they're rocking and that's out. That's pretty old, and they're rocking. Yeah, out. I just saw. Yeah, Joni Mitchell just turned eighty recently, that's not right. long ago. And yeah. she she did a performance. When was it at the Newport Folk Festival? It might have been a couple of years ago. She was amazing. Like, yeah. So so I realized that movie, because I love making movies, that's my mm -hmm. kind of thing that I, I, I've been involved with movies, but never right. making them. Right. And, and this is a story that kind of has a sci-fi twist. And I realized how many people really think about the only universal language, I mean, probably works anywhere in the universe, no matter what planet you're on, is music. Right. And it bridges right. the gap. So that's what this movie's about. It bridges right. the gap. Nice. In a very nice. simplistic way. And, and and you actually started critiquing my treatment for the movie. I did. I did. With, and very helpful. Cause yeah, well, you great. asked me to. So. That's true. But then you, your points were spot on. Yeah. But I love the idea. I love the concept. And I hope when you do it, I can get involved and help you. Yeah. So, well, it's going to happen. But... Back to the, the documentary. Right. Hey, I, um, I, let me play the clip. I think the clip will work now. Let's play that, and, yeah. and then we'll talk after it. Okay. Gene Mason, one of the singers for... Here, I'm going to just start it over. Here I love you. 23 states, where did your travels take you? Uh, they took us as far north. As I was talking to Gene Mason, one of the singers for People, and he said he was embarrassed to admit he'd had a hit record. I realized we needed to make new memories for the band, and that's when I decided we should record a new album. We haven't uh, played together in 50 years. and uh, putting this back together and see if we got another shot. So here we are, we're still good players, we're still happy, we're still having fun. We're going for it. So that's one of the cuts from the album, or a little excerpt from it. Nice, yeah, nice. Where can we get the album, Jeff? Um, I know people are gonna wanna pick up a CD. Well, Amazon, you can get it there. And then, of course, we're on Spotify and, and iTunes. So Great. they can pick the songs they like. I have my favorites. Um, but the, the interesting thing, if you look at the lyrics mm -hmm. for this album, it, it really specifically deals with my personal journey and I think the journey of the other band members. Oh, so interesting. It, it, the, 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 I think they're most, all the songs are fairly uplifting. They're positive. Mm -hmm. They have a message that is ultimately to make people feel better. Right. Although I went through some pretty tough times. <laughs> yeah. Which I can laugh about now, but. Yeah, and, yeah. And you and I kind of resonate with <laughs> tough times. Yeah. Well, we've known each other for, what, 50 years, I think? Well, something, quite a long time, like but that. it also had similar... We're partners in crime, actually. Yeah. And, and you've talked about that, right? In terms of how effectively you boosted... Yeah, I wrote a book about it. Yeah, minor yeah, thing. Yeah, great. Like, and um, not 
I only know a handful of people who could say that they had that kind of uh, energy that was effective for this for Scientology. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I mean, it, I tell you one thing it did was it put me in a really unique position because I had to work it. You know, I worked so hard for so many years. I read all of these scripts by L. Ron Hubbard. And then I worked on ads and I worked on marketing campaigns and I wrote seminars and I did all these things. So I had to use all of my sort of uh, cognitive cerebral abilities to sort of reinterpret Scientology. And it put me in a really unique position because then when I started to sense what bullshit it was and I couldn't tolerate the abuse that I was receiving, I had all of this kind of massive store of, of sort of logical connections that I could then use to take it apart. So it put me in that sense, it's re one of the reasons I came on YouTube was to help to, you know, kind of get that stuff out there and say, you know, because I think my role in all of this is to interpret what happened, not, you know, to point out the fact that I was hit or kicked or thrown in the, you know, oh, or, oh, no, yeah, yeah it's, no. or, or, you know, they, uh, it's not my role. My role is to say, like, this is what happened. This is why it happened. This is the motivation behind it. So, because you know that I was put in that position, well, I want to throw this up there. What is it? This is a. Oh well, that's that's the promotion. It's December. okay. As you can see, it's a crazy film festival that covers all these really many times dark subjects. But it's a well-known film festival. Wow! And especially with a name like Another Hole in the Head Film Festival. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, isn't that a vague reference, oblique reference to a Jerry Garcia song? I think you're right. I think you're right. Because it was another something I remember. A great, uh, anyway. Um, um, but but we are in San Francisco, and that if you're leading it up, or you maybe you can put just the address and the time. Um, yeah, well, I'm gonna po the, I'll post this. I'll put this poster in the show notes below. Oh, great. Yeah, because then if people uh, want to, and if people, you know, if you can make it, let me know. Uh, I would be happy um, if for the like first 10 people to be able to get, I can get tickets and they can contact me. Nice, because nice. Because it's happening pretty quick. I mean, before you know it, it's going to be Monday. And yeah, yeah, and I'll tell you, I, I saw the film with an audience when you showed it at the Studio City Film Festival, and it was amazing. I mean, I'd seen it so many times where you were editing it, and I went through it with you, and we talked about it, and then, uh, but it's really a different thing when everybody is kind of resonating with the same emotion, and everybody is kind of, it's like a shared emotional experience. It becomes, it's hard to, I mean, it's, it's kind of what film is all about. It's the reason why Absolutely. you go into a darkened theater and everybody's having the same experience. And it's, it was amazing. I was really moved out. There was a couple of guys, a couple of characters that showed up. I can't tell if they were from Osa or not. Oh, no, it's, look, it's, <laughs> it's Mike and Tony. Uh, yeah, so yeah, they, you have, they were in, they were in New York with me. Right. And, and Mike was very gracious in flying up from Florida, taking the time, spending a Saturday we did the red carpet, or they call it the orange carpet, and we got interviewed and, um, and people were recognizing Mike and, 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 tell, and you know, they'd come up to him and say, oh, I watch your show or I, I got your book. And he did some book signing while he was there. It, it was really, nice. it, it was in the nice. point of having the picture of those two people as those are the two people that were instrumental in helping me deprogram and actually Tony right. was my first contact with any truth about that organization prior to yeah, that. Yeah. And for those people who were never in, you're I was scared. To, I couldn't even go on the internet because they'd find out. I just knew they'd find out. Yeah, it's hard to to explain to people that have not experienced it that. My own story with that is kind of kind of funny because when at the when I got in the point where eventually I got in a lot of trouble, like everybody does, and yeah. I was up I was up at Gold, and I never really paid any attention to. Uh, Tony Ortega, I didn't give a shit. I was you know, deep busy doing my positive stuff for the church. I knew Mike really well, and I knew he'd gotten a, a really, uh, he'd gotten a really rotten deal. Uh, 
And so I just shoved Mike into a box and didn't think about it because I liked him too much to just, I was not, I was, I was not corrupted into ever thinking Mike was an S, you know. Person. Yeah, I mean, but the kind of, the way you see an, an SP when you're in, so it was like whatever, which is why, you know, Mike was one of the first people I called. But I had a quote unquote senior who was really a brutal bully and would come in my office and scream at me every day and I was just trying to figure out how to get the hell out of there. And one day she came in and she screamed at me and she said, you're just creating fodder for Tony Ortega. Uh -huh. and, I, and when she said that, I went, oh my God, did I do something and he's writing about me? So I started looking at his blog and that's how I became addicted to it. I looked at it every day. So. Oh my God, yeah. you, you, I, you never told me about that. that was the experience that I had. Yeah, I got, like some, I yeah. Addicted. I was addicted and he wasn't writing every day. He was writing in the village voice so it would be like two or three times a week and i would yeah i mean uh, yeah i had somebody driving me i had a driver because i refused to drive up there anymore i'm like i'm living in my house i'll figure this out there okay okay we'll pick you up in la and we'll drive you to gold i would drive up there i had somebody driving me up there like five days a week and on the drive i'm like reading tony ortega's blog figuring out how i'm gonna get the hell out of there thank god oh, for uh okay. thank god for uh for you know the pandemic okay so here's uh, tell me about this one. This is you and Rick Springfield. This is this is from the movie. I got to meet Rick, very talented guy, right. super sweet guy as well. And um, he, my brother, played with Rick Springfield. It's in the movie right. about it. And so Rick agreed to be interviewed because nice because uh, my brother, when he left our band, people. He formed another band, and that went away fairly quickly. Called it was Rocking Horse, really good R and B type band, excellent group, and they were playing clubs in L.A. All right. the time, Marina Del Rey. And then he got so busy with his clothing manufacturing company, and it was going so well that he stopped doing music. Mm. And and then somebody told him about Rick Springfield looking for a new bass player. My brother's really good, good player and good on stage. And he went out on auditioned and he got the gig, which was a primo gig to get. Right, right. So, um, so Rick was, I mean, we could do a spinoff of this documentary and, and my, there could be segments just covering right. the musical things that we did and the, different accomplishments that we had. Like I was in, uh, I wasn't living in the Bay area, but I was working for Apple. Right. That's in the movie too. But we only touch on it. Uh, right, sure. right. Yeah. The, man, the things that I saw when I, when I was during that time period, the late seventies, early eighties was, it was incredible. I mean, I was working for all these big corporations. Yeah, well, you know, it reminds me, uh, not to bring up Joni Mitchell again, one of my musical heroes, but uh, in this interview I saw, she said, you know, in the 60s, we all wanted to change the world. In the 70s, we wanted to change ourselves. And then in the 80s, we realized we couldn't change the world or ourselves, so we just wanted to get rich. So, yeah. <laughs> and I thought this is like exactly okay. like now, everybody you, I know. Did you come up with that? No, Joni Mitchell came up with that. It's absolutely brilliant. I wish brilliant. I did. She yeah, absolutely reflects the, the whole thing of the eighties. Yeah, it was amazing. We were all like motivated to make money. Yeah, everybody we just were wanted all to get the rich. Idealists, but we were the idealists. yeah, yeah. And then people were saying, well, you know, that's just the arc of a person. You know, you go from being liberal to being conservative. You go from not caring about money to caring about money. And that's really not true. That, no. That's like an oversimplification because we never lost our idealism and we never lost our desire to, to kind of work on ourselves. It just wasn't working. So we thought, yeah, let's just make some money. I mean, if we're, yeah, we're going to, yeah. let's go buy an island. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was... That around the 80s is when I really wanted to, to, to get out of the commercial corporate music I was doing, which paid me. Yeah, well. right. And I wanted to do movies. And right. In the 80s is when I started to be able to do movies, which was 
I was getting so excited again, so the passion was coming back. Right. I loved the storytelling, and then Celestial Navigations had its first, you could say, billboard charting record in the 80s. Right. Super excited about that. I was being a recording artist again. Right, right. So... Yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people understand what Celestial, I mean, Celestial Navigations, I saw you guys a bunch of times uh, and listen to your CDs. I don't think people realize what that, you should explain to the to the what, the viewers what Celestial Navigations was, because it wasn't just a band by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we're the only group that I know that was actually a really performing group that did modern storytelling and we got the, and we were like a band, like a rock band or something, or a songwriter that was well known. Right. And and um, Jeffrey Lewis was pretty well recognized because he worked with Clint Eastwood on some. Right. Shows. First, right. every which way, way but loose, and every which way you can, which were huge hits for Clint, put him on the map, and gave him the wherewithal to then do whatever the hell he wanted. And, right. Um, so we were, I was driven, I met Jeffrey in Scientology in 1969, before he was known by anybody. And I, well, we, I, you, I just let me interrupt you, because I want, I want you to cover, if you remember when I first met you, you'd been a Celebrity Center for a couple of years by then, you'd been in the Sea Org, out of the Sea Org, you were on staff at Celebrity Center, and then when I get, came in early 73, Jeffrey was just, you know, he was an actor at Celebrity Center. And, and he and Karen Block and some other people, they had that group. What was the name of it? They were called like the Theta Players or something. Oh, something like that. Yeah, and they used to do like uh, improv comedy. So, you know. It, yeah, so, um, yeah, that was the, those days were kind of interesting. Yeah, oh, listen, there's like, uh, I remember Candace Bergen coming into Celebrity Center. Do you? I don't. I don't remember uh, that. Well, that's because she saw through it pretty quickly. That <laughs> yeah. I remember her being there. And wow. uh, Stephen Boyd, you know. I um, remember Stephen Boyd. A lot of people don't know who he was. If you ever saw, uh, was the Ten Commandments, I think? He was the one who played. Uh, oh, no. Was it Spartacus? He yes. Played no, not, it wasn't Spartacus. It was... Uh, well, there was a chariot race. It yeah, was, but um, it was, yeah, maybe it was, it wasn't Spartacus. Yeah, uh, I don't know. But anyway, he was a very noted actor. No, it wasn't he, Spartacus, but it was, it was a big movie and, and he was just starting, his career was taking off. Yeah, yeah. And then he died of a heart attack. He was one of the first people to get into Scientology and then die. As a celebrity, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but yeah, Karen Black was there and... Um, a lot of uh, um, Chick Corea was there. Chick, yeah, Chick was just starting to come, and I'm trying to think of uh, the guy who did Kung Fu, David. Oh, Carradine, yeah. Carradine, he came in and performed there. Um, and then Wing, Wings Hauser, he was on staff there. He, you know, he back then he was Wings Living, right? Right. Yeah, the, the singer uh -huh. actor who Wings and I became yeah. really good friends. And we're still good friends. And, Is that uh, right? Do you still know Wings? Oh yeah. When I when I left. Interesting. When I left, I started contacting people that I was friendly with. Um, right. That I was friends with, and I, I Wings and I performed together. A lot. Really? He's a good yeah, musician. Well, I, I'm a, I was a guitar player, so. Yeah. Welcome, especially. Yeah, and and his artist. of course his son is a huge star on uh, Yellowstone. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, like... Uh, yeah, you know, for those six the six weeks that I lived with the staff getting off of trucks back then when I first came into Slurry Center, I, sh yeah. I was room I was uh, roommates with Wings. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, we stayed in the... So it's a funny, I wrote a funny anecdote about it in my book, but oh, he, was cool. a he was a great guy. Yeah, no, a talented guy. And yeah. Really, people don't realize he's a really good songwriter. Really? really good I did songwriter. not know that. I just yeah. remember he used to perform, and he was a very charismatic uh, singer-songwriter. Yeah. I, I, I can tell an interesting story if we're just doing anecdotes. Sure. Um, I mean, this one's 
he wings was outspoken a lot of times and we did a palladium gig for one of the big events i don't know what right. it was. this was early times so though i think i was the music director for that one gig because uh -huh. they had a band and, and and wings got up and was performing and then between songs he started into this rant about they that they were raising prices for the you know for their therapy the auditing and he was like verbally protesting in public on stage in front of the whole like the whole of la like because you probably had a few thousand people there wow. and he's he's ranting boy did that somebody started freaking instantly like during the gig they were freaking out i think they almost pulled him off the stage yeah i'm not surprised yeah, well but, yeah but, and he was gone much it wasn't long before he was just out of there so yeah but but they did some damage before he left. Yeah, but I think the point is, you know, it, it almost sounds like we're reminiscing about the good old days of Scientology. Mm, and there no. was a there, <laughs> there was a, I don't want people to get the wrong impression. Just um, just because Jeff and I find some things to smile about and found some camaraderie. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like why are you fighting for the guy next to you in the trenches? And there was this kind of period uh, where it wasn't that it was toxic, and you know, it was founded by. Uh, Yvonne Jentsch, uh, who was, did really care about artists. And then, of she course, Hubbard, Hubbard yanked her out of there, worked her to death, took the whole thing over. Then, you know, Miscavige made it his, his personal hobby horse for uh, stalking and, and recruiting celebrities yeah. and stuff. So then the whole thing just became insane. So, But yeah. because one really nice person gave a shit about people, some good things happened there for a short period of time. End of story. Well, yeah, I mean, this is, for me, why do I speak out? Why did I do the movie? Um, yeah, there's personal thing benefits you get from, like, doing a movie about it. I certainly got some some excellent therapy in, right. in doing a documentary about my brother and I. I've learned a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. But more I just, than that, you go ahead, I mean, sorry. There are so many good-intentioned people who did things that when they look back on it they're not proud of it you know I'm yeah not, and and some of us made friends for life <laughs> right well, Jeff, yeah so. i mean so i had to I, leave scientology to continue our friendship but that that's, that's not the re did. It, it's not the reason i left but it was a real benefit of leaving well that's the, for the other, sure the, the benefit um i mean whatever i don't regret my experiences and some were horrible. yeah at the same time i wouldn't be here talking to you i wouldn't be able to avoid, right. you know to enjoy our creative you know back and forth right you and i work together i mean you as a director and creative director me as a composer and musician and the fact is in the per very present moment right now you and i are talking yeah I know. And, uh, you know, I know there's a future there. So that future is like in the present to me as well. Yeah. That it's, and I think that's what I want, really want to yeah. focus on regarding. And I think this is a case for any person who is, you know, somehow controlled within a family or within uh, an organization that are high control toxic yeah. groups. You know, ultimately, there's somebody that we love or many people that we love that we met in the group. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it is in the present, we're out and we can reconnect with those yeah. people or have connected to them. Right, right. So, and I yeah. think, I mean, I was so thrilled to, to be hanging out with Mike Rinder and Tony Ortega <laughs> at the Dances with Film Festival. And introducing them to our friends you know right i got to meet bobby um uh, my spouse and and then um mike and matthew matthew hockley smith who is manages bobby he's from uh, from england they hit it off you know australian english you know so that the if you look at it that way there's just this infinite number of possibilities Right. That we don't even know about, you know. You may somebody who watches your 
um, YouTube channel that you've never met, they reach out to you, and then all of a sudden, wow, there's a connection there. Something, something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've, 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 a, l a few times I've kind of lost faith in doing this, and then I get a message from somebody that they're a drug addict or they're in some ridiculous thing, and that they listened to something I did and it gave them hope, and I'm. So, you know, that, to me that means everything because the, the, the worst thing that Scientology does is it steals your story and it kind of replaces your belief in who you are and what you are. It replaces with it a fiction. And the longer you stay in and the higher you go up the so-called bridge, the more it is until eventually you believe you're this eternal spiritual being who's lived for these trillions of years and you're inhabited by all these other consciousnesses and then you, you can't tell the difference between your thoughts and their thoughts. So you, eventually you just believe in this completely f fictional identity. And if you're wealthy and privileged and you can stay in that bubble, like in the matrix, then you can feel that kind of, that sort of endorphin, that warm cocoon of emotional support, which they're able to put around you to keep you from ever seeing the truth. Not if you're a staff member, especially a SEERC member, but if you're up at the top and you have money, or you're a celebrity, and you're, you know, you're, you're like, you'll be fine, but you, you won't leave without total collapse. And it's the thing that's so hard, that was so hard for me was like putting that story back together. I mean, it's the reason why I wrote a book, because it was kind of like brick by brick saying, this is what happened. Wow. This is what I saw. This is what I felt about it. And then slowly you displace that fictional story with your own truth and that that's what's been if i could share anything it would be the importance of doing that well i think your book has a relevance to more to, to many different um cultures and people well, even though it's so. specifically about the, the scientology control group it it's so universal and and, and you're yeah. being inside of it the way you were, I know, because oh, yeah. I was inside of a, a different part of it slightly. Yeah, different. but in a I, kind I, of a I, similar way. But yeah, I, I made an evil cult look good, and you made an evil cult sound good. Oh, I mean, that's right. Even the guy that I worked with for years, who's a very gifted composer, who did a lot of films for me, and this guy, I, I always thought, you know, he could walk out of Golden Air Productions tomorrow, and he could get a job composing. You apprenticed that guy. He was like your protege oh adam so Lee, yeah adam so it's just a like very, yeah talented guy and they snatched him up and and i ran into him at a, a synthesizer uh, symposium yeah and i ran into him and then another talented and almost dead person <laughs> peter schles who, who yeah no, he was the co-writer on one of my most beautiful songs on the yeah, way below the death. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Great song. And he went from that to when I saw him, he was kind of crushed. He looked yeah, like no, this. He, he, because he doesn't have an identity. Plus, he'd been in the, in the hole for years. They brought him out of the hole so that he could impugn Ron Miscavige. Literally, like that. Oh, they brought him right. out so they could sit him down and interview him about what a horrible person Miscavige's dad was. And then, you know, he, he got to come out of the hole. It's just oh, horrible. He was in there for years. It was just When really I, ran, I ran into him, I almost didn't recognize him. Yeah. I hear at, the you. Time, at the time, I don't think he knew that I was out. I think he right. thought I was still in Scientology. But I think Adam knew because when I... Yeah. Adam, sure Adam owes me a lot. I gave him... No, he does. And, and, and I think he went from you. You basically trained him. And then I think when they recruited him, he was working for Chick Corea. No, he was working for Mark Isham. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant Mark Isham. Yeah, so he went, you know, he had you, you know, like, and he I had Mark Isham. Yes, I recommended, because Mark and I were fr very friendly, and I right. recommended Adam to Mark. I said, Mark, this guy's brilliant, and if, if you need somebody, he'd be the guy, and he was the guy, and Mark yeah. was pretty... Pretty upset. Mark was not happy when, <laughs> when they they snatched him away and grabbed him. Yeah, yeah. Him. Speaking speaking of Mark, I mean, that's another one of those people who who's war wrapped in that warm cocoon of emotional support that's just oh, yeah. never going to leave. You know, they're they're like, it's it's they're it's like they're they're under 
24 seven love bombing. I mean, you yeah. know, it's, no, it's just, it, it, it is. They've got those little B 52s that are dropping the bombs all the time. Yeah. Talk constantly. But, but part, yeah. I don't want to get into his, I, I really, really respect Mark. As a yeah, I know. He's a tremendously talented composer. That's not what we're talking about. He's but, amazing. And I think I've, I've had this theory and it, it panned out. I think Beck was a good example of never really being in and he right. never really was. And I could tell that he never really was because his music stayed fresh. And you think it, the same thing of Mark, but Mark's really gone up the bridge. Well, he might have. So, and I, I, I don't, I don't know that I totally agree with that because, what's his, because what's his check, you know, was really in, and his music didn't. I think it's just a mindset. I mean, I think it's you can go up the bridge or not go up the bridge and make the decision to keep your art uh, in a pure state. You know, I, 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 I know that Beck got criticism from certain people for saying, "Oh, I was never in," but I completely understand that his viewpoint. No, he never he, well. I no, he never. That, yeah, he never it's was. just an internal commitment thing. I mean, yeah, your family's in, and your your girlfriend, you marry her, she's in. But it's a thing you can eventually leave and say, "Yeah, you know, I was never in." I mean, for the last fifteen years, I was in Scientology. I wasn't in Scientology. I was completely wow. gone. So I well, know, I know what that feeling is. Let me clarify something. Can yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I, I noticed with Chick Corea, and I noticed it with other yeah music artists. Um, I can say this. I love Chick Corea. He played on my on Celestial Navigation's album. He played on Jimmy Spiritus' album. Jimmy was a oh, did he? I singer songwriter. Yeah. And Chick, is, and at the time, Chick was just starting to take off. And and he then he did Return to Forever, which was right. a phenomenal group. I mean, a, right. a groundbreaking group. This right. is what I noticed. These people had the talent before they got into this cult. Absolutely. The cult gave them a boost. I, I will say that, gave them a boost. And this is something I observed with Chick. He never grew. He peaked early. Interesting. See, you would he know that I grew. wouldn't. Well, I do know it because yeah. I, I got to see him more recently when I was out of the cult and I went to see him with Bella Fleck. Brilliant performance. Today. Yeah. But I could tell the difference because I knew Chick 30 years ago and when he was at his peak. And there's no reason that he, sh he couldn't have progressed even more than he did, except you, c you can't be in a control group like that where you're actually living a lie and be tr truly creative. No, you're right, because you, 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 your work is, comes from you being authentic. I mean, yeah, that was so much exactly. of my frustration is because, you know, you, you, you're not just feeling like an imposter, you are an imposter because you're not connected to the thing that's you, and that's really the only thing you have to give as a creative artist, regardless of what it is you're creating. It has to be an authentic perception, and I wasn't. And, and, well, yeah. I agree, and and I think that you can, that the really great artists just keep reinventing themselves. Yeah, yeah. And they do that. They don't do it to make money. They do no. it because they have the passion. And right. honestly, when you're in that kind of a gr group, your passion gets directed into the group, not right. into your creative. Right. core which right. you know and then well, that core is really connected out towards the public in a really altruistic way yeah. you just want to move people yeah but if you're disconnected how are you going to be writing things and creating things that, that yeah move people? yeah and, and everything you Cruz, yeah and, and everything can, well he's an action star now he doesn't that's a whole other story but he doesn't do films anymore like, you know, Born on the Fourth of July or Magnolia or even Eyes Wide Shut. He's not interested in that sort of artistic exploration of the kinds of films that would get him an Oscar because he has, you know, he reflects a cult leader who is like, you know, let's be in charge of the most lucrative franchise in Hollywood. And we'll, we'll, well, exactly. But it's the same thing going on with him. And, and I was watching his career when right. he was more disconnected from. The organization and he was starting to be i mean he was really taking doing challenges he was challenging yeah himself. Uh, you and, mean other than strapping himself onto the wing of an airplane type challenges well, like no, he our, was, he, he artistic that, challenges he has that p potential as an actor i believe 
and I liked his work, but again, he peaked, and he and yeah. I knew this is maybe cynical. No, you're right. Artistically, he peaked, and then he became an action. You're 100 percent right, Trap. Like you're absolutely right about that. So so uh, and and that that bugs me because I want artists to be free, yeah, uh, emotionally yeah. and creatively. Yeah, what they do is they bring more humanity and you look at the films that do that right uh, and those are the people that create the interest and in, in, instead of war you have understanding you have emotional sharing you have huge audiences coming together as one mind yeah like, i mean taylor swift you know it's kind of a cliche but honestly she she really People go there because they want to be inspired. Oh, you know, yeah, no, she's a very unique artist. She's, she deserves it, it, everything she's getting. I don't know about this the, football player thing. I don't know about that. Yeah, well, but whatever. The whole thing, the, the whole thing but, makes, it, she makes a lot of sense to me as an artist. I'm not a Swifty, but I really appreciate her work. Well, and she, and from what I've heard, she gives back to her support team. She yeah, makes, she gave her, did you hear she gave her whole, her whole, uh, her, her Teamsters? She gave them all like a hundred thousand dollar, two hundred thousand dollar bonus, something like that. Well, which uh, it's insane. Nobody but does it's that. The way it sh it's the way it should be. And, and she has. She plus she's got more money than God. She's like, what is she going to do with it all except give it to the people? Well, and that, she is, she, and she's making. Yeah. And, she, and she has her point of view of she's socially conscious in a good way. Yeah, no, she's a good person. And, yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, and, and I believe that music artists in particular want to take on that role. They don't yeah, always do for it, sure. a lot of them want to, and that they just keep inspiring the artist instead of, you know, picking up um, AR-15s, they're picking up guitars. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and, did you see, did, sorry, you know, you know on uh, NPR they have the Tiny Desk concert? You know, you ever see that thing? No. They have artists come in. They have a little room. They have a piano and a desk and a book, some bookshelves. And they do a thing called a tiny desk concert. And they invite people in to come in and do an acoustic, a couple of acoustic songs. Wow. It's, you can look on YouTube. Uh, Taylor Swift did a tiny desk concert. And it is absolutely amazing. You get in these two songs, you get that she is one of the most gifted songwriters who's recording today. She's, I think she's really amazing. But, you know, this, I want to bring up another thing, Jeff, yeah. the art series. We've never talked about that. Oh I've never God. done any content. I've never done any content on it. I, I just oh, want to tell. We need to. We need to. You and I should right, do it. We'll I'm going to do another one. I have the art book, which is based on the art series. Just so, for you guys that don't know, you never ends and people that maybe you were in, but you, you weren't working on art lines. The, the, the Hubbard Communication Office Bulletins, which are the, you know, the, what they call the red on white, you know, all, sci all of Hubbard's uh, Scientological writings, are, they're, they're either printed in the color of money or the color of blood, right? Ah. And so yeah. the organizational ones are in the color of money, and then the ones that have to do with auditing are in the color of blood. So one of those color of blood bulletins, there's a series of them, maybe eight, I think they're called the art series. And these are the definitive writings on art. Everything you do as an artist in Scientology is held up against these eight writings from Hubbard. You will be judged and evaluated everything you do against these. It's just, I, I just remember that when you were talking in terms of how a person gets... We'll, we'll, uh, we'll have to do that because, you know, I, yeah, I put so much thought into it and I had to apply yeah. it. And I was on the ship when he wrote the Rhythm Bolt. I was actually there. Yeah, well, that was a, a that was not an a, that wasn't one of the art series rhythm. Okay, that's that was a, 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 a what do you call it, an ED, because that right, became one, right. one of yeah one of the cine EDs rhythm. He wrote this thing about rhythm and syncopation. Yeah, that's a whole nother series of writings that all of your work has to comply with. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, fair. and it's just insane. It drives you crazy as an artist. But I, I don't have those, but I do have the art book. Like they publish the art series in a hardback, like a coffee yeah, table. No, book. I remember it. We should do like a, a talk on each one of those art series because they're like. Well, let's, let's do that because I actually yeah. am catching a plane tomorrow and I, I have to pack. And I, yeah, I well, love, then whenever you have time, you. whenever you have time. No, no, I'll be back in LA uh, on the 12th. So 
Yeah, we should do it. Okay, so let's answer some questions, and then we'll. Well, I guess we'll. Okay. I, oh, but you had, you had. I just wanted to bring this. You had one last deck in here. These are shots from the film, right? Yeah, that's. Shot. That's a shot yeah. from the film, a still, and then we've got. Oh, well, what is this? That's that's uh, the the orange carpet in, in New York. Oh, that's a lobby shot, like when people yeah. were getting ready to go in. That's yeah. nice. So, that, so you that had a, cool. a pretty decent crowd. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and there's your oh. kids. I sent you both of those. Yeah, you did. And, you sent me this one. And so, and Hold on. So the, that you could flash. Yeah, I know. Let me find it. Unfortunately, they're not right next to each other. Uh, I, I do have, I, God, I hope I have yes. the other one. Oh, it didn't make it into the deck, but you have been cut out of this, the middle of this shot. Yeah. Uh, I, and I'm sorry, I but a, I don't have. Yeah. I did a, I did a, a short, um, like, trailer where it shows me in the middle with my kids. Yeah. And then it fades, and then I fade out. Yeah, and of course I knew them really well because our kids grew up together. Yeah, I could, they did. They were friends. Yeah, they were, they were very friendly. So, Colin uh, was, was friends with, with your, your kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, yeah. So let's answer some questions, and then we'll, we're, we're, we're pushing an hour, and you got to get... Um, yeah, packing, going. and then we did what we intended to do, which was drive people up to San Francisco. <laughs> oh, to San, right. December, right. Yeah, yeah, okay, so here, what is this? We've got One Love, uh, 5,100, uh, 51,000, I can't see it. Question, are you working on getting the film on a wider platform? I'm wanting to see it so badly. Okay, two things. Uh, for a short period of time, if you go to the... Um, Hole in the Head Festival um, website, I think you actually can uh, screen it. Really? Like it's behind a paywall? What's the deal? Or, I think so. I don't know what yeah. it is because I wasn't checking. But the, the next plan, because I, I really need to, to get, I'm going to get the, the film placed with some kind of platform so it goes public. And it, it, uh, I think right. that... From right. all the audience reactions I've seen, there is a public for this. Oh yeah, people, people would watch it. Would, yeah, I think for sure. Would watch it, and I think it's a whole different approach to like high control groups and how right. it affects your family. Right. No, I yeah, because there's really like a reckoning going on today. I, it just there's so much interest. People are sick and tired of it. I mean, when I when I left Scientology, I made a commitment that I was going to stand for a world that created less harm, and I don't care what kind of harm that is, whether it's bullying or shaming, or just you know the disenfranchising groups, whatever it is, I'm going to stand uh, uh, on the other side of that. It's just a thing you got to do. What is this here? This is from also from One Love Fifty One Thousand. Oh, okay. I'll read this piece of shameless uh, uh, promotion. It's hard for me okay. to pick favorites. Honestly, each creator has something different to give. I'm here for Mitch because he has a lot to tell that no one else experienced. So interesting. Well, thank you so much. As long as there's two people that are interested in uh, listening to me, I will come on because, you know, Jeff, I love to gas bag. Okay, so this was <laughs> this was earlier in the chat. This was from Matthew okay. Etienne Dumai. Uh, what are your three favorite STP creators? Uh, Mini Mitch, <laughs> Laura FM, and Aaron in this order. I guess I'm uh, Mini Mitch. Maybe it will. Anyway. Anyway, thanks. That's great. Uh, I think we've all been taking a little bit of a break. I know I have, like just doing less stuff. Uh, only because, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, people throwing bombs. It's not a good look. Okay, so I got a couple of starred ones here. I want to say hi to... Uh, to uh, Barbatees. <clears throat> Hi from Durham, North Carolina. Jeff, is your film going to be at the Durham Film Festival? It happens sometime in the spring, usually. Uh, so, Jeff, be. how about it? I don't know because um, it takes so much energy to do a film festival. And yeah, I'm but there's a lot of people in the South, man, and that's like Southern Blues country. No, I don't. <laughs> they want to see your film. Well, I'm hoping that by then it will be out, like either on one yeah, of the plat yeah. platforms or um, I, that, that's my hope because I really have been working on this film now for four years, I think, and I want to 
I, I don't want to do my new film. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. You get a, at some point you got to move past there. Okay, yeah. well, thanks for that, and hopefully it'll yeah, get on a you. it'll get on a platform. Be able to see it soon. Yeah, and uh, oh, Rev Girl, hey Rev Girl, she re receives your book, Mitch. Hey, that's great. Don't forget to leave me a review. Um, <laughs> so, really, I really need it. So, it helps. Uh, yeah, it does. So this is from uh, Casey said, like Marilyn, I also saw Brothers Broken when it was available for preview. It was amazing, highly recommended. Oh, well, thank you. So yeah, there's a, a little motivation that if you haven't seen it, it's worth the extra effort. If you live within, I don't know, 45 minute flight to San Francisco, it's yeah. going to be a it's going to be a party. I wouldn't miss it. Okay, uh, and here we go. Here's another one from. Uh, this one is from Rosie Dozy. Love the movie Brothers Broken. Well, thank so you. So we got some fans here, which is fantastic. Okay, we've already done that one, and that uh, that covers it, guys. I got cool. two more little, uh, uh, and so I got one here for Freezy, Freezy New Project of Forsyth. Mitch, so glad I got to catch this live with you and Jeff. Hey, well, Frizino Project, we're happy to have you. It was kind of a last minute thing. Yes, Jeff, it was. Thank you, Mitch. I, I, I asked Jeff to, uh, uh, I, yeah, I asked Jeff, uh, I, I do it. so, you know, we did the Dianetics ads together. Jeff did the music, which is like the most, he and his partner uh, composed it, and it is like hands down the most memorable audio signature ever recorded in the history of advertising. And Almost. so then, what, what, sure. can you think of one? There, okay, there's the Dianetics theme. Did, 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 did. There's plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. Oh, right. And, yeah, and then there's the Intel. Bum, 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 Intel inside. Right, and right. That's it. That's it. You can play You're those right. three, and everybody will remember them. And the other ones, they're like, yeah, sounds familiar, but I don't know what it is. So then when I was promoting my book, I called Jeff up, and I said, write me some music that sounds like the Dianetics music, and he said, okay, I'll do that in a way that we won't get sued. So he did some music for book ads, and now I'm doing some more book ads. I called him up, and, and uh, we, we decided we needed to come on here and talk about the film. Uh, so yeah, it's, I'm glad you caught it, and it's great to, to do that. Um, and uh, Freezino Project said, comment, I remember those commercials from when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah they, were, no they were big. Uh, and um, this is one love 51,000 said thank both of you for being here it is our pleasure and uh yeah it is absolutely our pleasure and so we're gonna we're gonna that's it for the questions jeff needs to go he's got to pack he's got to get some sleep we're gonna bring this thing to a controlled landing now and i just want to thank everybody oh yeah, wait there's you. one more thing hold on jeff there's okay. one more thing we have to do it's oh yeah it's hanukkah here let me what Happy it's Hanukkah. the third night of it's the third whoop hold on it's uh it's the third night of Hanukkah and yes. um yeah hold on here I'm gonna this will just take a minute we're not going to do any prayers or anything because I'm no I'm I won't I, I don't want to screw up I yeah I'm, yeah I'm not a, I was never a good Jew I mean I bailed out on I bailed um, out on Sunday school cause I, I just, was I was bar mitzvah so I, I yeah no I my parents were pretty liberal they were like yeah you don't have to do that you're going to miss out on the catch. So anyway, I just share this with our friends. It's the fourth night of Hanukkah, and I'm kind of doing this uh, third in support. Night. In support, yeah, third night. Sorry, this is in support of the children that are in peril in Palestine. Uh, not to get political, but so uh, if we were really good Jews, we would be. We would right now be uh, saying a prayer. Yeah, the brook on time of Norway. Yeah, but our, at least our, our parents. Oh, and by the way, I hope you guys are all digging on my Disney menorah because these are actually all the Disney characters. You can see uh, this guy here, the the uh, the ninth one, which we use to light. That's called the Shamus, and that would be Goofy. Goofy. Yeah, and you can see on the uh, the tenth night here. I mean, the eighth night here is uh, uh, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Oh, I kind of got this menorah when my kids were little. But it's still my favorite one. So oh, that's cool. Yeah. Anyway, happy Hanukkah to all of happy our Jewish Hanukkah. friends. Thank you for and, tuning in. Yeah. And for the rest of you guys, we'll talk to you soon. Jeff, good luck. We'll talk soon. Thank you, man. <laughs>
Oh! <laughs>